Excuse me, it doesn't work. It's my bad, sorry. Thanks. Okay. Just let me know when I should have started. It's no hurry. Okay. Uh, morning, everyone. Sure. Uh, it does not sound like me. Okay. So what should we do? Nothing. Uh, nothing. Okay. So uh, once again, morning, everyone. Welcome to the first session of the day. The title of the session is Practical Fault Injection. And we start with the paper, Practical Multiple Persistent Fault Analysis. And the speaker is Hossein Hadipur. Thanks for introduction. Good morning, everyone. And I'm very pleased to present our work entitled Practical Multiple Persistent Fault Analysis, which is a joint work with Hadi Suleiman, Nasser Bagari, Prasan Aravi, Shivam Basin, and Sarah Mansuri. By practical, I mean an attack which can be performed on a regular laptop in a few seconds. This is the overview of my talk. I will first give a brief overview on a PFA fault attack and point to the research gap in this direction that we filled in this work. And next, I will introduce our new framework for PFA with multiple faults and introduce a generic key recovery framework which goes deep into the decryption and exploit the fault leakage until the first round of decryption to retrieve the, the master key. And finally, conclude the talk by summarizing our main contributions in this work. So let's start by the introduction and the research gap. Fault attack was introduced in Europe in 1997 and it has two steps. The first step is fault injection in which we inject fault into the cryptographic device to disturb the cryptographic operation. Next, we observe the, uh, the fault decipher text and analyze them to retrieve the secret information. In just 2018, uh, a new type of fault attack was introduced, which is persistent fault attack. Unlike the transient fault, which remains only for, uh, for a few click cycles, persistent fault is, uh, remains until the result of the device. For example, the injected fault in PFA typically changes the stored algorithm constants. It can be, for example, the lookup table of an SBOX if the implementation is, uh, yeah, employs a table-based uh, implementation of a SPOX. Uh, in PFA, it is assumed that we can inject the fault before the encryption. For example, when this lookup table is loaded from flash to SRAM, we inject fault to uh, distort the one of the, for example, load instructions. And after that, all of the uh, encryption uh, employs the faulty SPOX. Another assumption that we have is uh, that we can collect multiple faulty ciphertexts. So let's see the core idea of PFA. The core idea of PFA is quite simple. For example, take this uh, box as an example and this very uh, simple toy cipher on the right hand side. We have a box and we mix the key after that. So if we inject the fault and alter one of the entries in this lookup table, for example, E here, change it to anything else, we can see that E will never appear in the output of this box, right? So we can use this as a distinguisher to filter the line keys because we know that, it is assumed that we know that E is not appeared in the output of a box, so we can try different, uh, for example, cyber text, follow the cyber text and exclude the wrong keys. Okay, by observing the first, first cyber text, for example, we can conclude one key. 
And if we have sufficiently large number of ciphertexts and only single fault, we can uniquely retrieve the key by excluding all of the wrong keys. The search space is just uh, one byte because we can do the attack white by white. We can retrieve the key byte by byte. For example, this shape uh, represents the last round of A. Yes, you can skip the shoot row because uh, it doesn't change. It doesn't mix the uh, bytes. You can do the attack byte by byte and retrieve the last one key byte by byte. It's quite simple. Just excluding the line key according to the ciphertext you have. But uh, let's see what is the limitations of PFA. This uh, figure represents one of the basic limitations very well. Uh, the horizontal uh, axis of this figure represents the number of therapy cyberdays that we have as an attacker. And the vertical axis represents the entropy of the key after fault analysis. Then there is only one single fault, lambda represents the number of faults. When the number of faults is one, you can see that we can uh, uniquely insert the key. If we have sufficiently large number of ciphertexts, for example, more than 2,000 faulty ciphertexts. But the problem is for multiple faults. When we have multiple faults, for example, uh, the entropy of the key for two faults is 57. It means that after fault analysis, you are left with two to the 57 key candidates for the last one key. You know that uh, the key length of this is 56, right? So retrieving the correct key, even if you have access to a correct point ciphertext, is uh, even harder than reinforcing the key space of BES. Re uh, remember that I told you we want to achieve a practical attack, which can be performed on a regular laptop in a few seconds, but it's not practical. So this is the research gap. Let's, uh, let me summarize the main limitations of PFA. First of all, in PFA, there is a basic assumption, which is knowing the location of the fault. For example, in this box, we assume that we know fault is injected on E and it is excluded E. What? It's just an assumption. Is it not necessarily hold uh, in practice? Uh, for multiple fault injection, uh, we are left with multiple key candidates after the fault analysis, right? If the number of uh, faults is more than one. So the question is that, uh, what if we don't have access to a plain text and its corresponding current, correct ciphertext? Because we, uh, it is assumed that we have access only to the faulty ciphertext. How we can retrieve the master key? Do we have a reference? Another limitation is that PFA only exports the fault leakage in the last round. It doesn't go deep into the decryption and export the fault leakage because if the, uh, the implementation is a table-based implementation and if you inject the faults into the lookup table, all of the encryption rounds employ the faultiest box, but we are only exploiting the last round, the fault injection in the last round. It is another limitation. I should mention that uh, in 2021, an enhanced version of PFA, which is EPFA, was proposed to resolve one of, one of these limitations, which is exploiting, for example, the fault leakage in multiple rounds. But EPFA is not clear about uh, exploiting multiple faults in deeper rounds. In addition, EPFA still relies on the assumption that we are aware of the location of the fault. Uh, so, with this introduction, let me introduce our new framework, which remove uh, almost all of these limitations. The point of our method is quite simple. Let's represent the impossible values in the output of Sparks by V. When you inject fault, you are actually excluding multiple values from the output of Sparks, right? In this attack. So, let's represent it with, with V. And let's represent the impossible values at the position of ciphertext with D. So if we do the attack byte by byte, for example, DI represents the impossible values in the ith byte of ciphertext. And as an attacker, you can uh, retrieve or drive D very uh, easily because 
you just observe the output ciphertext and uh, drive the impossible values. So another simple relation is that uh, the relation between D and V. You can see that D is equal to V plus K, K I and equivalently V is equal to K zero, for example, plus D zero. If you combine these two simple relations, you have this uh, relation, which is the actually help us to transform the difference between D sets to difference between keys, key bytes. And as you can see, delta, for example, represents the difference between K0 and KI. Delta I represents the difference between K0 and KI. And at the same time, delta I is the difference between D0 and DI. As in fact, you have access to D0 and DI, you can efficiently drive delta I. And then you transform this relation to the difference between key bytes. For example, by observing D0 and D1, you drive delta one, you have one linear relation between K0 and K1. You know that left-hand side of this relation. You can do the same for K0 and K2, so on and so forth. So you have 15 linear relations between these six, 16 bytes of restaurant key. Just guess K0 and uniquely determine the other bytes. The size of K0 in AES is one byte. So just uh, the entropy is just eight bit because uh, there, there are only two to the eight possible cases for K0. And if you guess K0, you can uniquely determine the other bytes. Quite easy. Just compare it with the two to the 57 in the original PFA. With a simple idea, you can reduce the key space, the entropy to eight bits. But after all, we have several candidates, right? We should uh, be able to uniquely determine the master key. Another uh, thing that I should mention is that as long as the last round key uniquely determines the master key, we are happy. This is the case for AS128. If you determine the last round key, you can uniquely determine all round keys as well as the master key. So, we are left with multiple candidates, and I want to uh, introduce our generic key recovery framework, which goes into the uh, decryption rounds and uniquely uh, retrieve the master key from these remaining candidates. The idea of our generic key recovery framework is again very easy. Um, let me introduce uh, yeah, a simple notation. Uh, for each key candidate, we fix the key last, the last one key, and we drive the impossible values in the output of S box, which is represented by V, okay? For each key, we have a corresponding V. Then we go deeper into the decryption rounds to filter more wrong keys. But the problem is that S box, the faulty S box is not bijective. It's not invertible. We cannot do the decryption, right? It's cheating. But so, uh, we do the cheating, we use the correct S box for decryption, and we consider the wrong key assumption. By wrong key assumption, I mean, we assume that if you put the wrong key in our, for example, generic key recovery framework, all of the intermediate values are uniformly random variables. This sort of code uh, briefly describes uh, our key recovery framework. It's quite easy. For example, for each key candidate, we drive a V set, then we initialize a counter for the corresponding key with zero. And for each ciphertext that we have, we start to do the decryption until the first round and check one thing. We check um, the output of S box in each round. And uh, if even one of the outputs is in V, uh, we don't increase the counter and we try another ciphertext. Otherwise, we increase the counter because the corresponding key is likely the correct key. The quality of satisfying this condition or equivalently the quality of increasing the counter for the corresponding key can be uh, drive very easy because uh, 
you can see that it's uh, equal to one minus the size of V over 256 to the power of 16 because we are checking 16 cells or 16 bytes in each round. And we are ch just checking the membership in this V. You can see that the property of this event is uh, derived from this relation. And analysis this algorithm is quite simple. Let's see what is the expected value for the counter for of the wrong key. If you put the wrong key here, the expected value for the counter is right from this formula. Because uh, if you start with a pool of any faulty ciphertext, you can see that after one round decryption, you are left with E times N faulty ciphertext. And again and again, until the first round. And the counter for the, the expected value for the counter of Curry's key uh, can be calculated very easy again. We increase the counter for the crate key under two conditions. The first condition, which is represented in the uh, green uh, path, is that um, uh, none of the uh, intermediate values is infected or by default. In this case, the correctest box that we use and the faultiest box are the same, right? Because um, the intermediate values corresponding to the ciphertext that you are decrypting is not affected by default. And we can compute the quality of this event because it's quite easy because of the simplicity of uh, our generic Q framework. Another condition that you, uh, under which you increase the counter for the correct key is that the intermediate values is infected by default, but again, it satisfies this condition. It is possible, right? And we can compute its probability. See that even one of the outputs of bytes in each round um, is infected by default is one minus p. And the quality of satisfying this condition in line seven to nine is p. And we can see that, for example, the quality of happening to the two, uh, the second, second condition is one, one minus p times p. As all, uh, I don't want to go to the detail further. I would just, uh, I would just like to mention that you, you see that there is a huge, gap between the counter of the correct key and the counter of the wrong key. And it gives you a powerful distinguisher to distinguish the correct key. Just let's see an example. We experimentally verified our frameworks, our query recovery framework, our, our, our PFA framework. We applied this attack on uh, two implementations, uh, on the tiny implementation of AES, tiny AES, the so-called tiny AES, which is a simple round-based uh, implementation of AES, and LD64. Interestingly, we observed that having multiple faults is more likely than having single fault. And when we have multiple faults, for example, in the case of AES, having six faults is again more likely than having other number of faults. In case of having six faults, if we have, for example, 1526 faulty ciphertext, we are left with only 256 key candidates after fault analysis. And if we uh, try to retrieve the master key with our general key, uh, key framework, you can see that the counter for the correct key is about is around 6,000, and the counter of the wrong key is around 3,000. We computed it uh, using uh, simulation and using our theoretical formula. And you see that uh, that's, uh, they are almost the same, particularly for the wrong key. So detecting the correct key is quite easy because there is a huge gap between the counter of wrong key and the counter of correct key. So we come to the end of this talk where I'm gonna summarize our main contributions. First of all, we removed the assumption of knowing the fault location. It doesn't matter where the fault is injected. You just apply the faults. And again, it doesn't matter how many faults, is, uh, how many faults are injected. You just observe the faulty ciphertext and determine the number of faults. And then uh, the rest of the uh, procedure. Another contribution is that uh, our new technique decreases the number of key candidates in the fault analysis significantly. For example, you saw that uh, we reduced it from two to the 57 to two to the, two to the eight. It's uh, an improvement by a factor of about two to the 50. And you can do the attack on a regular laptop in a few seconds. We also exploited the fault leakage uh, in deeper, deeper rounds of decryption, not only in the last round. 
we also, if you refer to the to our paper and uh, uh, see the monitors, you would see that uh, our technique also uses the number of required uh, faulty cyber text. Thanks for introduction and all of the, the source code of our, our, our simulations are available in this GitHub repository. Yeah, I will be happy if you have any questions. Thank you. So we have time for, for short questions. Uh, anyone? Yes, Parish there. Okay. In this slide, you mean? Uh, for example, you see that uh, there are counter values derived from the simulations. For the one key, for example, is 3197. And uh, the uh, counter value from our theoretical formula is 3197. But as long as you can do the simulations, because uh, it's quite easy, you even don't require a theoretical formula because you have a huge gap between the counter of uh, correct key and the wrong key, and you can uniquely determine the correct key. Imagine that so you are left with 256 candidates, right? You just put these 256 candidates into the Q recovery framework and try them one by one and de uh, and uh, compute the counters. Uh, in our simulations, we just uh, uh, please, uh, uh, we perform and we implemented the. Uh, the algorithm, for example, on one of the ARM microcontrollers family. And so uh, we just uh, draw the faulty ciphertexts from, uh, for example, uh, the implementation. And then uh, by analyzing the uh, ciphertext, you can see that by just uh, analyzing the ciphertext, you can drive them in possible values at the position of ciphertext. And then you can drive uh, the difference between the impossible sets and so on and so forth. Sorry? In, uh, in, in the original PFA, as you can see in this slide, or in PFA, yeah, you require less for this hypertext. But it's uh, in the original in the original false model of PFA, which was introduced in 2018. Just let me switch to this slide. Yeah, it is assumed that we have access to multiple ciphertexts, something around 2000. Yeah, it's the false model. You require multiple ciphertexts compared to the DFA. Yes. I hope I answered your question. I'm not sure. Thanks for your question. Very short question from the uh, from chat. Did you test on mass data? No, it's just implementation on a simple round base of AES. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you too. Ah, let's do this offline because we are already late. Okay, so I just see the time there. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, second talk is beware of insufficient redundancy, experimental evaluation of code based fault injection countermeasures. And the speaker is Sven Bettendorf. Yes. Hello, everyone. My name is Sven, and um, thank you for the introduction. And I'm, I'm going to present the work, um, Beware of Insufficient Redundancy. And this was a collaboration work with uh, Timo, Torben, Falk, and myself. Um, so let's get started. So um, 
Four injections are um, a crucial three, uh, threat to um, to, uh, to to some, some uh, sorry um, because of the uh, 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 rising amount of Internet of Things devices. Um, uh, sorry. So let me start again. So because of the increasing amount of Internet um, Internet of Things devices, the um, fault ejection is a serious threat because the access to um, cheap but security relevant hardware is increasing. And um, right now there are different um, attacks um, already published like differential fault analysis or statistic fault analysis. And uh, right now the common countermeasures are sensors and, and some kind of duplication. So nothing too special. Um, next up, we looked at the at the newer um, countermeasure. It's called impeccable circuits, and this is based on error detection codes. Um, and this is um, this is offering um, protection against different fault analysis. And during our work, they published an, an add-on to their work, and where they also claim security against um, Cypher. So this is based on um, concurrent error detection. This means every um, fault is um, recognized on the fly. And the special part about it is that the fault propagation is also, also taken into account um, when building the countermeasures. Um, and as always, the security on the countermeasure is relying on the um, underlying adv adv advisory model. Um, and as stated in the paper, it guarantees the detection of any fault in the circuit if it's covered by the EDC. So our question was how hard it is to overcome these assumptions and to introduce faults that lead to a faulty output. So in the, in the paper, they introduced three different variants, um, the red one, red three, and red four. Um, and the red one is uh, like a simple parity bit. So this is a one bit security per nibble. And this guarantees every, that every one bit fault is detected. The red three variant is the Hemming code. This is a three bit redundancy per nibble and the red four is the extended Hemming code. So the, the best one is the red four variant where it guaranteed that every three bit fault is detected. And they also um, added an add-on that is the multivariate adversary model. Um, and this model, every fault, so there are, this is possible that they inject faults at multiple clock cycles. So in, without the multivariate, um, only one fault injection at one special clock cycle is possible. And with the multivariate model, um, there is every fault at every possible clock cycle is detected. So in the example of red four, um, three bit faults are detected even if you hit on two different clock cycles. So now, uh, Little overview of the schematic. Um, here is the schematic for the red one and the red three variant, where uh, on the left side is the normal um, skinny algorithm. So we used skinny in, in our experiment. Um, and on the right side, there is the, the redundant part. Um, and the S box, uh, not the S box, the function S on top is transforming the 64 um, input into the, to the code um, domain. And for the red one, this would be 16 bit. And for a red three, this would be 48 bit. And as you can see, um, there is a checkpoint um, in every round after or before applying the, the subsets. Um, but be, uh, because the subsets is not possible on the code itself, there needs to be um, a data transfer, transfer just before um, applying the S box. So here on the red line, you can see the data is transferred from the um, skinny algorithm to the redundant part. Um, and next up, we have the red four variant. There we have no transfer between the um, between the skinny algorithm and the redundant part. And this would be similar to the normal duplication. Um, but here the um, S function is again transforming the input into the code domain. Um, and for the normal duplication, there wouldn't be a need for a function. It would be just the same on the left, uh, the same input on the left and on the right side. So a little short overview about the um, implementation details. Um, of course, the unprotected version uh, uses the least amount of area and is the fastest and the, uh, low, uh, the lowest power consumption. Um, 
but is also offering the lowest amount of security. Um, then we have the duplication with um, a little bit more area, and then we have the different uh, red variants. And as you can see, the red variants without the multivariate are um, faster than the duplication, and everything above red one is taking more space than the duplication. So um, with uh, with this in mind, we try to to answer the question: Are the assumptions reasonable? So are they even as secure as they think they are? So what we did, we did an experimental proof of the um, of the assumptions, and we did it with a laser fault injection from the backside, and we got the um, the countermeasures taped on on an ASIC with um, 40 nanometer low power XAMOS technology. And we used a neo diac laser um, and two different spot sizes. So these are quite large. It's 5.6 micrometers and 28 micrometers. And all the countermeasures are based on the uh, detect and suppress principle. That means that if they detect a fault, the output is um, muted and we only receive zeros. So we never receive a faulty ciphertext if the fault is detected. So what we did, um, we first opened up the, the ASIC from the backside. So we um, uh, dig a hole and, and manage to reach the backside of the ship. Um, then we thinned the silicon, so we have um, better result at the end because we can better focus on the on the um, on the on the um, course. And then we polished the ASIC, so we have no reflections. So this will offer better results. And last but not least, we then. Um, we did the laser attack. So on the right corner, you see a layout of um, on the left from the designer. So there they marked us the um, the position of, in this case, the duplication core. And on the right, you see our results from the from from the laser test. So as you can see, we have um, the areas are kind of identical. So we so we um, so we see we we are on the right track. So we actually focus on the area that matched the layout. So next up are the results. Um, and what we managed to do with the unprotected implementation as expected, we managed to fault um, the calculation in about 60% of our attempts. So um, we receive faulty outputs and with the faulty outputs, we can then um, calculate uh, the key with the, uh, with the differential fault analysis. And for the duplication, also as expected, um, we did not receive any faulty ciphertext, so every fault we injected was uh, detected and the output was suppressed. So there we were not able to calculate the um, used key. Then uh, next, the red versions um, for the red one, we managed to inject faults in 1% of the, uh, a little bit less than 1% of the attempts. And we managed to um, also calculate the, the key. And for the red three variant, we, um, we have a lot uh, percentage of um, successful attempts, but also enough for a successful DFA. And uh, only for the red four variant, we did not receive any faulty ciphertexts. Um, these are um, these results are for the normal versions and the multivariate versions. So overall, we can say that we successfully um, faulted the red one, red and red three versions. Um, we expect or we know that we um, uh, we injected more faults than the ECC is covering. So um, we can say that the assumption um, with a little bit less than the full redundancy is uh, not sufficient because in practical um, experiments, we inject more faults than, than um, expected. So is the duplication sufficient to cover um, attacks? Um, I just say no because um, of the adversary model, and there are different um, already published attacks that are possible. For example, the simplest one would be a double laser injection, where you hit uh, both cores with the same fault and you receive the ciphertext. Or one of the um, most famous attacks in the last year, where the um, statistical ineffective fault attacks that would break any um, detect and suppress principle. So this is also what we what we did. So we um, we performed a cipher a cipher attack on the uh, duplication part. For the um, parameter optimization, we used the um, unprotected version. So we managed to um, 
to optimize the, the um, use delay for the laser and the energy. So there we could um, then only um, step over the whole area and look for a spot where the ship answered in half the times correct and half the times incorrect. So we kind of have a, have a bias in the, in the cipher text and uh, the correct key nibble was the, um, was the, was the um, uh, three. So our CIFA analysis also showed that um, three was the correct byte. So we had a success attacking the first key nibble with cipher. So next is the conclusion. Um, what we can say is that one bit and one and three bit redundancy is not enough penable because um, in a real world experiment, we always um, inject more faults than less faults. So it's much easier to inject um, multiple faults than single faults. And um, the simple redundancy offered more or uh, better results or more security than the uh, simple duplication. Um, right, so this one the, 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 that I showed again uh, at the beginning of the schematics um, is not correct, uh, it's not good because here the transfer is um, not sufficient to cover all the security requirements for a real world attack. And last but not least, um, the, the assumptions from the paper were only realistic for the red, fear, uh, red 4 variant. Um, and this is also offered more security than a simple redundancy because like I already mentioned, the double laser attack um, would be um, easier on the normal duplication because you have inject, you, or you need to inject the same fault in both um, variants on the normal skinny algorithm and the re, um, redundant part. And for the red 4, you need to inject different faults because the code is, um, the code needs another fault than the than the or, original um, algorithm. And also, um, the Red Four is offering this a little bit more security, but um, of course, is way more expensive in the area. Um, so, what I would like you to to take away from this um, presentation is that um, the importance of verify, for verifying the assumption and hypothesis um, are very important to to verify in a in a real world scenario because um, a lot of um, security proofs are only theoretically and um, then can be broken in a real world experiment. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm welcome to answer them. A lot of time for questions. So. Yes. Hello. Sorry, I don't I don't get it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we use two different sizes. One time the 5.6 micrometers on the other side the 28 micrometers. So in the overview, you see the results for both laser spot sizes. So, uh, Larger ones or smaller ones? Um, we did not try because um, we already had success and we, we made, we, so we tried one la uh, smaller size. Um, where the results are similar, so we just stick with them. But probably with the larger spot size, we, we would inject even more faults. Yes. Yeah, but it's po four per, per nibble, so we have to, to fold multiple of four. So four, eight, yeah. 12, every bit in between will be detected. Yes, thanks. Sorry, the first part I didn't get. Uh, no, around hundred thousand or hundred fifty thousand per per core. Ciao. Um, 
And probably is yes, because with smaller technology, we hit more parts, so we flip more bits. So probably is. Yes. Here. Hello. Uh, you can the model that there will be uh, some uh, uh, training in the uh, for injection uh, person, but we will deliver that model. Sorry, again, the first part the sound here is. Yes. So if we have a safety design, a small model, Yes, with this countermeasures, I expect that even if the technology gets smaller, we have the same results. So we just go down with the spot size and hit the same amount of, of gates again. Uh, more questions, audience, in person. Online, I see nothing. Okay, let's thank the speaker again. The third speaker of the session is Yaron Delvois. He will uh, present work called Roulette. Diverse family of feasible fault do attacks want, uh, on mask Kuiper. So we will start soon. With all the um, uh, do you want a or do you want uh, this again? This again. Yeah. Um, Thank you for the introduction. Our target is Kuiper. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, our target is Kuiper, which is a post quantum secure key encapsulation mechanism based on the learning with errors problem and which will be standardized by NIST. The goal is to transfer a symmetric key between two parties using asymmetric crypto. The party on the left uh, performs the encapsulation and will generate a random message um, that using a KDF is transformed into a symmetric key. This message is also encrypted into a ciphertext using the public key and sent to the second party on the right. Um, which performs the decapsulation by decrypting the message using the private key. Um, and then from the recovered message, you can again derive the symmetric key using the KDF. Uh, however, uh, to resist uh, chosen ciphertext attacks, uh, some additional logic is needed. In particular, the recovered message needs to be re encrypted, and the ciphertext that comes out is then compared to the input ciphertext. And if they don't match, then there is a rejection by not feeding the message with a constant into the KDF. The starting point for this work is a fault attack on the Kuiper decapsulation presented at Indecrypt 2021. Here is the same diagram of the decapsulation with some more detail. Um, so the part of the ciphertext we are interested in is a polynomial V with uh, 256 coefficients, and each coefficient has four bits. And the message is 256 bits in a way that each bit of the message corresponds to exactly one coefficient of V. So M0 only depends on V0, and one only depends on V1, and so on. Now, the attacker manipulates one coefficient of the polynomial V. It doesn't matter which one, so let's say V1. And the manipulation is a bit flip uh, in a way that the faulted, uh, the manipulated value better uh, is the original one plus four modulo 16. And for this particular manipulation, it turns out that the recovered message, which uh, M1 prime is either correct or wrong with around 50-50 probability. And the correctness entirely depends on the private key. 
uh, there's uh, the re-encryption then will provide an avalanche-like effect. So if M1 prime happens to be wrong, then uh, pretty much the whole ciphertext is corrupted. If M1 prime is correct, then it is, it is possible to pass the ciphertext uh, comparison using a fold, uh, in particular a bit flip in either input operand of the comparison using a laser. And uh, whether or not this check is passed provides one bit of information so the attacker can derive um, whether or not M1 prime is correct. And this provides one linear inequality over the private key and fewer than 10,000 inequalities suffice to recover the key to get a solvable system. This work we facilitate and diversify the attack. Firstly, we extend the attack surface. In the Unicode paper, the attack surface is the two input operands of the ciphertext comparison, which also leads to a new countermeasure where these two operands are protected. In this work, uh, we show that uh, several building blocks of the re-encryption are vulnerable as well. And this way we can bypass the countermeasure that is proposed in the Unicode paper. Secondly, we relax the fault model. Uh, originally, the fault model is single bit flips using laser. We support various equipment through various fault models. So we can have random faults, set of zero faults, the one faults, instruction corruption, instruction skips, and arbitrary bit flip patterns. Thirdly, masking is regarded as a countermeasure in the original work, although best used in combination with other countermeasures. In this work, um, masking directly helps the attack. Um, so there is a net positive effect, which is not to be confused with indifference or zero effect. Lastly, for solving inequalities in the original paper, um, on a single thread of, um, say, a modern uh, web computer, it takes uh, 100 minutes to solve uh, a reference system of equations. Uh, inequalities better. Um, and uh, up to that point, uh, it is only known that you can have a 1% error rate. So, at most 1% of the inequalities can be incorrect to still solve the system. In this work, we provide an acceleration. Uh, so now it takes uh, less than one minute on uh, similar uh, under similar conditions to solve the system, and also we can go up to 25% errors. Uh, because of these four advances, we can provide a proof of concept of the attack using a ship is a board. Uh, while in the original work, uh, the attack is uh, simulated in software uh, exclusively. Despite these benefits that are offered, so this uh, larger attack surface uh, supports from fault models, uh, masking as a facilitator, and also the ability to use uh, cheaper and more diverse equipment. The one minus here is that we need to inject more faults in order to get the key. The number of faults that is needed is uh, multiplied by a factor somewhere between 10 and 100. Um, so that means that the execution time of the attack will be higher. Uh, however, the execution time is still a few days, or if you have a very well optimized implementation of Kyber, possibly less than one day. So this remains a feasible attack. Uh, also to put this more into context, execution time is not all that matters. So here we have the total time to mount the photo attack and we split this into five components. So T1 is a training time to get acquainted with the fault injection equipment and with the target device. T2 is target preparation, which is decapsulating the chip, soldering. T3 is building the setup. So this includes uh, writing the Python scripts to control the fault injection equipment and the device itself. Uh, T4 is calibration. That's, um, you can see that as a testing phase where you see how the device uh, responds to faults. And T5 is the actual execution of the attack. Well, only um, D5 is, is uh, higher uh, in our um, iteration of the attack. Um, and this is also something that can, that can happen uh, overnight or during the weekend. So it doesn't require any active input of the attacker, uh, which is not the case for some of the earlier components. And because we can use uh, not only cheaper, but uh, various other equipment and a laser, um, there is some potential to, to lower the sum of T1 until T4. Then the launcher attack surface in the Immigrid paper, the attack surface is a two input operands of the ciphertext comparison. Um, and to protect these operands, they provide a countermeasure where, these, uh, where the ciphertext is not simply stored in RAM, but stored together with the hash value of the ciphertext. 
Uh, and then also compare this way. However, this countermeasure is imperfect because if you, if you inject a fall before the hash value is taken, you can bypass it. And that's uh, exactly what we do. We look at all the components that lead up to this uh, ciphertext coefficient. That is a compression, that is a barrier reduction, that is an addition, that is a decompression, that is uh, error sampling from a central binomial distribution. And that are also butterflies in the last layer of an inverse number theoretic transform. So we can inject a fault early on in any of these building blocks. Um, so here we assume it is a decompression. And if this fault is, uh, if the faulted value is somewhat uniformly distributed on the prime field, then because of the propagation properties of the algorithm, the ciphertext coefficient will also be somewhat uniformly distributed on 0 to 15. And um, because there are only 16 possible values, it's not going to take very long until eventually you will hit the same value as on the left of the slide for the integral paper. Um, say if you do 20 attempts, there is already a good chance that you have it. And um, this way we can bypass the countermeasure. The analogy we make in the paper that is also um, from which the title is also derived is, is a roulette wheel. So we have a roulette wheel with 16 beans and with every fault you will spin the wheel. And eventually, um, by pure luck, you will um, hit the one value that you want. Then the relaxed fault model and why masking is a facilitator. In the Indicry paper, the fault model is single bit flips using laser. In this work, we support various fault models. The first example, um, which is a trivial example, is the random fault, um, which is a well-established model in the literature. Secondly, we have masked hardware. Uh, suppose we have a function f that is split into um, numerous chairs. Uh, here we have two chairs, but it can be more also. Um, well, if you can set uh, one of these output chairs uh, to zero or to one or to any constant, then it can easily be seen that the unmass value y is uniformly distributed, which is exactly what you want. A third example is masked software. Again, we have a function f that is split into chairs. Uh, if in one of the share functions, uh, say f1, we can corrupt an instruction or skip one in a way that the folded output is independent of the original one. Um, well, then uh, again, it can be seen that the unmass value y is uniform. In the paper, there are, uh, there are more examples using bit flips, uh, not here because of time. Uh, the main message is that because we have more fault models, we can also use more equipment. Uh, we can do things like plug glitching, voltage glitching, electromagnetic fault injection. Besides using a laser, we can still do that. Then solving the system of linear inequalities, uh, which may look some, uh, which may look uh, like this, at least for one version of Kyber. Um, so the number of we have system A X plus B uh, X are the unknowns and there are uh, 1,536 unknowns that are all integers between uh, minus two and two and then we have 7,000 or more inequalities and for each row or inequality we know the sign we know it is greater than or equal to zero if you have a decapsulation failure and we know it is smaller than zero if you have a decapsulation success. Um, in previous papers, I solve this using belief propagation, which is an iterative algorithm. So for each um, variable, uh, for each unknown, um, we maintain a probability mass function, a PMF. Uh, so we have one for x1 and all the way until x1536. Um, initially, these PMFs are equal to the central binomial distribution because um, that's the error distribution from which these variables are drawn during the key generation that is. And um, then there are multiple iterations where these uh, mass functions are updated. And eventually they will start to look like point distributions that hopefully point out what exactly the um, secret is. Uh, we make two improvements um, to this algorithm. A first improvement is to reduce the computation time. The computation time is uh, high because in each iteration there is a need to compute the distribution of more than 10 million uh, random variables that are linear combinations of the unknowns. In the, in the grid paper, they do this exactly, which is linear convolution. But even if you do this in the frequency domain, where you have uh, analog and complexity, so using the FFT, and even if you uh, implement binary trees to optimize the reuse of intermediate variables, 
even then it remains a heavy competition and uh, they have uh, 15 minutes per iteration on a single thread of um, a typical computer. In this work, uh, we use an approximation instead. So we will approximate these random variables um, using a normal distribution um, according to the central limit theorem. We can do this because these um, variables depend on, on many other variables. And then we end up with uh, less than five seconds per iteration. The second improvement we make is to have a higher error tolerance. Um, so during the iterations, we need to uh, compute the probability that an inequality is satisfied, given some info about the mass function of uh, the union X. Um, well, we incorporate a, a, a correction here, where we take into account that inequalities are only correct or incorrect up to a certain probability. And this probability can be estimated based on the total number of decapitation successes and failure that is observed. So normally it should be 50-50, but if you see something else, if you see like 70-30 um, or 80-20, then you know that there is a certain error rate there and you can estimate this error rate based on the numbers you have. Uh, here's a plot for, uh, this is for uh, faults simulated in software. So we can exactly um, have the exact error rate that we want. Um, on the horizontal axis, we have the number of inequalities and vertically, we have the success probability for correctly guessing uh, an unknown. Uh, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, so here's the plot now. Um, so horizontally, we have the number of inequalities. Vertically, we have the success probability that uh, an unknown is correctly guessed. Um, uh, yeah, so we need to get to one to get full key recovery. The, Leftmost curve, the one in blue, uh, that is with a 0% error rate. So there we need less than 10,000 inequalities to uh, get the key, which is in line with uh, previous work. And if you have 25% error rate, that is a curve in green, then we can still solve the system using 30,000 inequalities. So the benefit of supporting a higher error rate is that your fault injection setup does not need to be uh, perfect. Um, so you, you relax the requirements in there. And, also, uh, you need more inequalities if you have a higher error rate. So that means that our previous acceleration technique using the central limit theorem will pay off. Uh, our solver is publicly available on GitHub and also as a chess artifact. Then uh, super per experiments. So the board on the left is used to generate a 24 megahertz clock and this uh, clock is uh, glitched by exerting it with a small pulse. And on the right, we have Kyber running. Uh, a mass implementation taken from Korn at Alieni. Uh, and this uh, particular implementation is now presented in a session parallel to this one. Um, and it runs on an Arncode XM4 of an STM32 ship. And because of the glitching, uh, there is an instruction corruption or instruction skip in the last layer of the inverse multi-retic transform. Fortunately, this implementation is unoptimized. Um, firstly, because this, it is um, portable C code. That means that the numeric theoretic transform is uh, not written in assembly in like some uh, other uh, recent implementations. Uh, so we will have a performance hit uh, from that. And also we are clocking at a rather low frequency, only 24 megahertz, while the device is actually capable of going up to 168 megahertz. So because of that, um, it will actually take five days here to get enough inequalities to uh, recover the key. Uh, which is still a feasible attack, uh, but not very convenient um, for um, getting data to write a paper uh, where you want to do experience in bulk. So what we do instead is we assess the correctness of the inequalities because we know that we can already solve them, not only from this paper, from, but from previous works also. And there's a plot here. On the horizontal axis, we have the uh, number of uh, fault injections per... Oh, I guess, sorry, again. Um, we have the number of um, fault injections um, per inequality, uh, and vertically we have uh, the number of them is that, and, and vertically we have the inequality error rate. So what we need is we need to get below 25% uh, because that is, what, that is what we can solve, uh, and we see that with 20 or more attempts we can get there. To conclude, our contribution is to open patterns for the attacker, so we can use more building blocks to attack using more fault models with higher error tolerance and using masking as a facilitator. And because of that, we can have uh, more diverse, cheaper, and less reliable uh, equipment. 
Um, for further research, um, we can do experiments on optimized targets um, to see how, how fast is that can go. Uh, we can assess the vulnerability of other post-quantum algorithms besides Kyber, and uh, also design of new countermeasures. Thank you. Questions? Let's check chat. Okay, so let, let me ask uh, first question. So um, uh, when you say for future research uh, uh, vulnerability of other algorithms, do you have any suggestions where to start? I mean, are there algorithms that would be better fit for this attack or? Uh, the, the most likely candidate uh, that was uh, Saber. Uh, but considering that Saber was not selected uh, for standardization and also not um, passed to the fourth round, uh, maybe the interest is a bit lower to do that. Uh, and for other algorithms, uh, uh, I didn't look into it, so I have uh, no idea. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me ask then one more. Uh, I keep not really interested. So basically, you said the 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 paper from Indocrypt, so the, the countermeasure they suggested actually does not help the defense, but even the attack. Do you have any suggestions in what direction to build countermeasures that would help? Um, well, um, briefly after this paper appeared on ePrint, uh, there was uh, another paper by uh, Ravi where they already proposed one. Um, so what they do in that paper uh, is um, uh, this attack uh, or this countermeasure they propose is not only against uh, the new attack but also against the original Indicrypt attack. What they do is, um, um, well, well, for the attack we need a particular manipulation where we have a, a quarter rotation. So we do plus four molo 16 as a quarter rotation and they uh, detect exactly that. Uh, and that would that would work also for um, uh, I, I hope uh, yeah <laughs> okay thank you last chance audience questions okay then let's thank the speaker and we are now the last talk of the yes you will. Okay, because I saw two. Yeah, Maximilian. Okay, so this is double, uh, double uh, <laughs> uh, talk. So both Bode and Maximilian will uh, will present in in some way or other. Let's see. And the title of the work is on the application of two photon absorption for laser uh, fault injection attacks. Yes. So maybe yeah. Uh, one to use that microphone and then you just use the other one to, to make it more efficient. Okay. Uh, okay, I think I can be heard. Yeah, um, I will give this talk together uh, with my colleague Maximilian um, from the TUM chair for laser and X-ray physics. I'm Bodo Zemke from the Fraunhofer ISAC. And yeah, the previous talks were more about um, how to exploit faults. This talk will be um, on the fault injection process um, itself. So how we can inject um, faults by laser-based fault injection. And yeah, laser fault injection is considered the most precise method for fault injection in, in general. Um, we have high temporal um, precision, so we can have very short pulses. Um, in the nanosecond or even picosecond range, which allows us to um, be very precise and target individual clock cycles. We have a high spatial precision, so we can 
um, have very small spots and um, yeah, very selectively um, choose where to inject um, faults on the dye. Um, we have a high pulse repeability or high pulse rate um, with diode lasers. You can easily go into the megahertz range and do yeah, multi fault injections or multiple fault injections uh, one after another, or you can even have multi-beam fault injections, uh, for example, using two lasers and inject two faults at different locations, but at the same point in time. All this is possible. It makes laser fault injection a very powerful tool. However, you also have um, limitations, uh, challenges, and, and, and some disadvantages, perhaps. Um, most notably, we need um, the um, device access. So um, laser-based fault injection works best from the chip back side, um, going through the silicon substrate. From the front side, in principle, it work, would work as well, but um, we have a reflection on the, on the metal layers of the chip and that um, for modern chip tends to work very, um, very yeah, poorly. So the best option is to go to the silicon substrate. Um, however, that also needs, depending on the package, that's not, not so easily accessible all the time. So for a BGA package, for example, that can be, can be quite challenging. And this leads me to my next point, device preparation. Device preparation is always necessary for, for laser-based fault injection. Um, apart from, uh, no, despite other fault injection methods, like for example, EMFI, where you don't have to necessarily prepare your device um, for laser fault injection, it's always um, yeah, necessary. And um, even more, it can, can be, or often is necessary to thin the silicon of the die. So you don't um, only open the device, but you also um, thin the silicon substrate of the, of the chip um, that can be done by mechanical grinding. However, that is also some, um, yeah, requires specialized equipment to do that um, because you have to be very precise. It's time consuming and it bears the risk that you damage the die or crack the die. So it's, uh, it's, it's um, yeah, um, it's broken. And in the worst case, that might even be something which is detectable by countermeasures. And last but not least, um, so laser fault injection is the most precise method. It um, also has its limits uh, there. Um, the spot size is mainly limited by the wavelength of the laser. And there we are fixed to the near infrared range if you want to detect from the backside. And also um, the beam diameter. The wider the beam is, the, more, uh, the better it can be focused. But there I just have practical limits from the objective lens, which I can use. So in the end, that gives me spot sizes around one micrometer that's the best but is achievable state-of-the-art technology and with that you can for example with the 90 nanometer technology load um, have very precise faults and a high control over that so i can even control if i want to do bit sets bit resets that's possible but um, that doesn't scale any further than that so on smaller technology nodes for example 10 nanometers that won't be possible anymore so that raises the question um can we do, do better than that um can we have better precision can we have um, lower requirements perhaps on the device preparation and perhaps even something which is harder to detect. And the answer is yes, otherwise we won't be standing here. <laughs> and um, yeah, my colleague um, Maximilian will then now explain the, physic the physics behind that. All right, so uh, let's start with the commonly used uh, single photon absorption as we call it. Um, so the band gap of a silicon semiconductor um, at room temperature is about 1.12 electron volts. Therefore, we need photon energies um, above this uh, band gap energy or wavelength uh, below 1,110 nanometers for the excitation of an electron um, from the valence band into the conduction band. And as a result, um, a fault um, can be triggered. Um, this whole process is not possible for wavelength above one. 1110 nanometer um, because you can see here um, the absorption coefficient of silicon so um, above about 1000 nanometer the absorption is zero um, and therefore no electron hole pair can be generated so we have kind of a um, trade-off problem because on the one hand we want to be transparent with our laser um, for the silicon substrate um, on the other hand we want to be absorptive in the silicon semiconductor um yeah so we have kind of a um yeah uh, we have to find a sweet spot here 
um, which is the 1064 nanometers um, at this point. So there can be a solution. That's the two photon absorption, as we call it. Um, so how does this work? So we still need the 1.12 electron volts um, of photon energy, but we can just add two photons uh, with half the band gap energy. And therefore we need the simultaneous absorption of these two photons. So the first photon elevates an electron from the valence um, into a virtual intermediate state. And the second one elevates it further into the conduction band. So there's a lifetime for this virtual intermediate state of about uh, one femtosecond. So we have a very low prob probability um, for this process to happen, um, but we increase this uh, with uh, high peak laser intensities, short pulses, um, and therefore increasing the amount um, of photons available for this process. So now a short theoretical comparison between uh, SPA and TPA, because I'm a physicist, so of course uh, I have to show some equations. So as it comes to intensities um, below 10 to the power of six watts per square centimeter, um, we get this linear relation between the absorption rate um, and the intensity of our, of our laser. Um, yeah, now we can integrate this equation and get an exponential decay of the intensity due to the absorption um, in our device. Um, as it comes to higher intensities, uh, we got a nonlinear relation um, in the case for the two photon absorption. Um, and therefore, we got um, yeah, um, a dependency of the square of the intensity um, for the absorption rate, which will be important um, later on. Uh, of course, we can integrate this uh, as well and get an um, expression for the intensity inside the device for the two photon absorption. So now we can combine this as a total absorption. As a step further, we can um, yeah, formulate the electron hole pair um, generation rate inside our device. So it's just the number of, um, of generated um, charge carriers um, in a yeah, certain time step. Um, as I told you in our experiments, we only focused on the two photon absorption. And that's why we can neglect um, this contribution here. Um, and so we can theoretically formulate um, the number of the generated um, um, charge carriers um, in our device. And again, this is a very highly nonlinear um, process and only valid for very high intensities and ultra short laser pulses in the range of um, femtoseconds. So while we are doing all these considerations and uh, the, the theory, um, because we found some benefits of the two photon absorption uh, compared to the single photon absorption. Uh, the first one is the transparency um, of the silicon. The second one is the focal width. So we got an um, effective focus, um, which is even below the theoretical limit, so how tight you can, you can focus your laser spot. And uh, as a result, we get a selective excitation um, referred to the depth um, of the material. So to make this uh, more visual, these benefits, uh, we did a small simulation. We just used the equations um, I showed you before and put in our laser parameters. Um, so you can see here on the right, um, the, the simulation of the charge carrier density inside our device um, for the wavelength of 800, um, 1064, and 2000 nanometers. So commonly used uh, single photon absorption setup and our new um, approach with the two photon um, absorption. So it's kind of a top view on the, on the device and we are taking here from the, from the bottom um, inside the chip. So the first advantage, as I told you, is the transparency. Therefore we can compare um, 800 nanometer and the 2000 nanometer. So we see here, um, we have a lot of absorption at the air silicon uh, interface um, at the entrance of the, of the chip. So we don't even reach our, our target um, plane at 70 micrometers. So that's where uh, we want to, to attack inside the chip um, because of the absorption um, of the silicon. For 2000 nanometers so for our um, two photon absorption, um, we get a perfectly located spot um, at the at the target area, um, yeah, because there's no absorption um, um, of the silicon, we we have you know uh, no intensity losses um, at all. Um, 
this is beneficial because we don't need to, to thin our substrate or to remove um, the silicon uh, substrate. Um, therefore, we have no risk, uh, no risk of uh, loss or damage due to thermal effects because of the absorption um, yeah, or through the, the, thinning, the thinning process. Um, the second benefit um, is the focal width. So as you can see here in figure C and, and D for the commonly used um, SPA uh, setup. So um, we got six times more charge carriers uh, than for two photon absorption. And yeah, we are generating kind of a, a current through the whole uh, chip, um, which can cause latch up and, and other um, effects. Um, for the 2000 nanometer here, um, because of this non-linearity inside the material, uh, we got a focal width, an effective focal width um, of about a factor of one over square root two smaller than for the um, single photon absorption. Um, and therefore we got our focal spot um, very symmetric and a localized excitation inside the device. So as a result, overall, we got the precise excitation. Um, again, in comparison in figure, figure A here, we got the single photon absorption for 1,064 nanometers. So we got a broad range uh, where we excite um, charge carriers. Um, and in comparison, the two photon absorption here, very localized and sharp um, spot. So how we do this uh, in the experiment, so how we can realize this, as I told you, we need high intensities and very short um, laser pulses. Um, and we at our chair can provide such laser pulses and that's why this whole project and the, the cooperation started. Um, yeah, so our laser system delivers uh, laser pulses with a wavelength around 700 nanometers um, and a pulse duration of five femtoseconds. So at first we have to keep these pulses as short as possible. So we have to compensate for dispersion. This is done by fused silica glass wedges. Um, another important um, component here in the setup um, is a chopper wheel and a shutter. So we have to reduce the pulse repetition rate from four kilohertz um, to single laser shots. Um, and another important uh, component here is the nonlinear crystal. So our laser system uh, delivers about 700 nanometers, but as we just learned, we need um, around 2000 nanometer um, infrared light for the two photon absorption. And that's why we have to generate um, this wavelength here um, in a nonlinear linear crystal. Um, yeah, so of course, in the end, we got our ob objective and, um, and the device under test. So here, in conclusion, uh, comparison between the, the parameters on the device um, compared um, to the regular single photon absorption setup. So the most important um, parameters are here the focal width. Um, so we got an official focal width uh, that is yeah, larger than for the SPA, but we have this effective um, nonlinear response of the material, which is uh, way more smaller than for the single photon absorption. And of course the pulse duration with about 10 femtoseconds, um, again, 800 picoseconds. So now I hope uh, I could convince you on the on the benefits of the two photon absorption, at least on the theoretical side. But now Bodo will present our experimental findings. Yeah, I think I have to speed up a bit because we're pretty late on time. <laughs> um, yeah, so we used um, this uh, um, the setup and our regular SPA setup, uh, which is shown here uh, to do a um, yeah some kind of comparison, which wasn't so easy in practice. So what we basically did was um, two very basic experiments. So we had two ARM Cortex M0 based microcontrollers and we ba um, basically did some experiments on the on the on-chip SRAM in these, these devices. So we had an Infineon XMC, which is 65 nanometer technology and an NXP controller with 140 nanometer um, technology. And yeah, we used the Infineon chip for doing an, um, yeah, some kind of precision um, comparison. We scanned a certain area in this SRAM, did multiple laser shots per location, and um, just yeah evaluated how much single bit falls we we were able to 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 generate. And for the TPA setup, we achieved in in fifty percent of the cases at the best locations and a single bit fault. Um, 
not with the SBA setup. And that's astonishing, as you saw on the, on the previous slide, we nominally have here a much bigger spot size with the TBA setup. So this shows that due to this non-linearity in the generated charge carrier density, we get a much sharper effect here. And um, then we uh, looked at a second chip here. This was a chip, um, yeah, we also scanned the SRAM region of this chip. We had problems with that uh, in, in, in previous experiments. Um, with the regular LFI setup, once you um, yeah, targeted the SRAM, um, the chip immediately reacts with a, with a hard reset. Um, and that wasn't circumventable, even if you tuned the laser power um, way down. There um, was either nothing, or if you if you tune it up a bit, you you directly uh, got a, a hard reset, but no no faults um, so to ever. Um, our explanation for that was that we uh, our hypothesis that is um, that we triggered uh, actually a ledge up effects inside the device, and um, ledge up effects are yeah short circuits uh, actually, and this is detected by the brownout detection. Um, we we'll quickly uh, explain this here on this slide. What you see here uh, is uh, a cross section from a regular CMOS inverter. And for fault injection, we ideally wanted uh, did want to inject charge carriers here in the in the reverse biased um, PN junctions of the of the of the blocking um, MOSFET. So that depends on the actual data value which one of them is is fault sensitive. But that's where we want to to have our um, charge carriers. However, um, there are also um, parasitic bipolar junction transistors in this uh, in the scheme, which I depicted here by this dashed line, and they form a circuit uh, circuitry, which you can see here on the right. The problem with that is um, if we induce this um, photocurrent there, which is, is labeled red, um, yeah, we have a current flow through this um, resistor, which uh, results in a voltage drop, which will then open this transistor, allowing to flow current here. And um, this will then also open this transistor, allowing to current flow in here. And so this whole thing latches up there, the name comes from. And um, even if this photocurrent then vanishes, this thing stays um, active and we have a short circuit basically, which is only resolvable by an, uh, um, yeah reset of the device. That's the only way uh, to get out of that. And um, if that happens or not, how likely that is to happen largely depends on the exact chip technology. Um, for some, it's likely for others, not so much. And so we repeated the whole experiment here with our TPA setup and looked at two locations in specific here. And the result which we saw was um, that we had no problems at all injecting faults um, here. And um, what you see is basically just a an, an depiction of the number of, of uh, uh, injected single bit faults. That's not so important, actually. Um, our explanation for that is that um, <laughs> that we um, yeah have drastically less charge carriers in the silicon substrate, and that's why this works. Um, yeah, in the paper we also discussed the, the impact on certain counter countermeasures. Um, where we had, might have slight um, uh, um, advantages for, for, for sensor-based countermeasures for redundancy, it doesn't make a uh, difference. This is uh, quite obvious, I would say, um, for something that most prominently light uh, detectors, for example, um, due to the sharper excitation of the of the material, it's, it's, it will be easier to 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 get um, yeah in the in the uh, inject faults in the vicinity of those without triggering those. So, but um, for more details, you would have to look in the paper, I would say. So in conclusion, um, we, we have shown that the two, uh, two photon absorption um, actually has quite some nice um, advantages for um, laser-based fault injection. Um, we have very good charge carrier um, um, density only in the focal point. This means that we only uh, also don't um, have to bother with the silicon substrate thickness. And even our, um, so we, we have it, the, the spot is vertically um, um, located in, in, in the silicon. Uh, it's also more narrow in the, in the, in the horizontal uh, distribution, meaning that we have a smaller effective spot size, which is uh, quite um, advantageous. And yeah, that can help us circumventing uh, certain um, countermeasures. And yeah, there's uh, further potential for more research uh, to, to do that. We were only able to do very limited results so far, but yeah, that will conclude the talk. And thank you for your attention.
Okay, we have time for some questions. Yes, Parish. Uh, so our reason for the 2000 nanometer um, yeah. so we, we we thought simple so with 1000 nanometer you got uh, the perfect uh, perfectly uh, energy for the for the band gap and with double the wavelength uh, you got half the band gap energy so this was our our simple approach um in fact um you can use 1500 nanometer and get even better results because the nonlinear um reaction of the material um is a bit better and you get an yeah sh more sharp focus yeah, spot yeah. With, with, of course with shorter yeah. wavelength to get a better better precision yeah. so that was just the first experiment we did we discussed it in the paper that of course a bit shorter would be even beneficial but you have to be careful in our experiment, we also take, took care that we um, only had the two photon absorption effect, so we wanted to stay out of the of the of everything below one thousand, um, so to say. Otherwise, we have a superposition superposition of both effects, and um, you also have to, to 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 bear in mind that was seen on on one of the slides so the, the width of the spectrum. Um, you can't do that arbitrarily small. That is just because um, there is a physical relation behind that the shorter your pulse is and we have really short pulses here the broader it gets in the spectrum so you can't have both and um, i can't give you the exact numbers for 10 femtoseconds how uh, sharp you can do it in the spectrum um, a bit better probably than that but um, yeah yes one more there behind you here is the duration of the pulse. We use the same duration of the pulse in that So that was perhaps if I got the question correctly and a misconception we didn't do experiments on those here, this is was just something we discussed in the paper, this is not. Uh, covered or not. Um, there were no practical experiments on those here. So we just reason we, we just reasoned about what might be be benefits because it was also practically very difficult to, to evaluate this. The ones for, for, for the setup reasons we had is what not so easy to use actually and we had limited measuring time because the laser source was also used for other experiments. Um, and also from uh, uh, from the security side, it's actually quite hard to find targets where you can say that the specific countermeasure is in there because normally you don't get this information from a commercial product, how the countermeasures in there look like. So that was a bit of a practical problem. If somebody has an target which one might to try we can uh, yeah i would be glad to to talk about that uh last minute questions last let me just check chat oh there is some okay was there any trials from front side staining is still required for back side and sorry, something about front side. Was there any trials from front side? Uh, no. 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 Okay, um, so no trials. Because of the there. reflection, of course, it also holds for the 2000 nanometers. And that won't get better, no. Mm -hmm. And is thinning still required for backside? Uh, no. No. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay, let's bring the speaker. Speaker. Uh, so this finishes the first session. Now is coffee break. One important announcement. There is a lot of posters outside. So use the opportunity and check some of the posters.